is to be a partner, that is to share in. And as was mentioned in the sermon before uh, mine, or at least in the, uh, in the lectureship book, this does not mean that we will become deity as he is deity. I'm an opponent, you know, anything of those nature, of that nature. But it simply means that as we grow in our knowledge, we become more like him in the fact that we live a more godlike life. And in this way, we become partakers of the divine knowledge. And to become a partaker of the divine knowledge, this includes escaping the corruption of the world. Uh, Paul Pear said, to escape that world is to partake of the divine nature. One cannot partake of the divine nature without escaping the world. The two go hand in hand. And so God has given the Christian everything readily available for growth. But there's also God's expectation for growth. That is the Christian graces. Let's look at verses 5 through 7. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. The American Standard Version translates the beginning of this uh, for this very cause. And so in light of the exceeding and great promises given on the part of God, Christians are to make an effort to grow in, in their lives. And the American Standard Version translates the KJV, KJV's <coughs> giving as adding on your part. And I think that's interesting, uh, that statement, the words, your part. There are a lot of individuals in this world who will teach the fact that Christians have no part in their salvation. They have no part in uh, they're going to heaven. And yet Peter said that we have to have our part. We have to do our part. Uh, and so we have to fulfill our part in order to go to heaven in essence. And so if a Christian wants to inherit the precious promises of eternal salvation, there are things that we must do. You can look to the statement that uh, uh, Paul made to Christ on the road to Damascus in Acts 8 verse 9. And he trembled and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into that city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. What is it that was told to him when he was in the sea of Damascus? And then I told him, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so there was a part that Paul had to fulfill. And of course this was to be done with all diligence. Meaning that it should be done without any delay whatsoever. Now as far as the word added, Brother Guy in Woods wrote that originally it meant to be found and support a chorus to lead a choir, to keep in tune, uh, and then to supply or provide. As here he used, the graces which adorn the Christian's character are to be forced into a grand symphony to the delight and pleasure of him who fashioned and made us for his good pleasure. It will be seen that there are eight of the graces, and that they thus form an octave of soul tones, the first being faith, the last love an octave higher, when these are harmonized and played on by the divine spirit, disharmony disappears and life's discords vanish. How we should rejoice that we have been privileged to provide such an instrument in the hand of our God. Now, before we actually get into the Christian graces, I want to quickly address a popular misconception uh, behind these graces. Some individuals will read this and make the statement, okay, first, I need faith. Once I've got faith, I'll get virtue. After I get virtue, I'll get knowledge and so on. Well, that's not what Peter's saying here. These are all things that we as Christians already possess. They are already in us. You know, there are people in this room right now that, you know, you, you've got, uh, you're strong in faith, you're strong in virtue, but maybe you're not as strong in knowledge as you should be. Or maybe there are individuals that are Christians that aren't as strong in brotherly kindness as they should be. The picture here is that of a chain. And let me ask you, brother, how strong is a chain? It is only as strong as its weakest link. It doesn't matter how strong the other links are. If you were to attach it to a, to a post and to, say, maybe a vehicle and you were to pull, it's only as strong as that weakest link if that weakest link is going to break. How strong is a Christian? They are only as strong as their weakest link. 
And so the admonition on the part of Peter is to strengthen these graces in our everyday lives. And so we need to make note of that, and we need to keep in mind how important it is that we do that. And so what are these Christian graces? Well, he begins with faith. This is the foundation of these graces. And we remember the fact that the Apostle Paul said that without faith, it is impossible to please him, Hebrews 11, verse 6. And virtue. This isn't just having the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong, but it's also the courage to do that which is right. And that was an important thing to tell those Christians during this time because Christians were being harshly persecuted. And you know what the punishment for doing right was? Whereas we won't go into depth about it, uh, if you have the opportunity, I would suggest looking up some of the things that these Christians faced during this time period. But doing what was right in the sight of God meant that the Christian faced a harsh and oftentimes brutal death. And so they needed to have courage to do what was right, knowing what would befall them for doing that, or what could befall them. Brethren, it still takes courage for us to do what is right today. We may not face death uh, as the Christians in those days did, but we will face certain persecution for doing what is right in the sight of God. We will be ostracized by maybe relatives, maybe those who were once our friends, and maybe even certain brethren uh, will turn away from us for doing what is right in the sight of God. And of course, we know the fact that the world will hate us, such as the world hates Christ. John 15, 18 through 19, 1 John 3, 13. Knowledge here is slightly different from that which was mentioned uh, earlier. This here means a seeking to know, an inquiry, an investigation, especially of spiritual truth. Temperance is the idea of self-control. It's the idea that I have to keep myself in control of my thoughts, my actions. I have to be in control. And just as Paul buffeted himself and controlled his actions, so can and so must every Christian control himself lest he becomes a castaway. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. Now, patience is an interesting one. Talk to... Uh, you can talk to any individual about patience. And more often than not, they'll say that patience is something that I want. I want it now. Or you can talk to my parents and ask them about patience, and they will say that they prayed for patience, and God gave them my brother and I. Well, patience from a biblical sense, though, is endurance through the difficulties of life. And, of course, this becomes easier for us as Christians when we look at certain passages like Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3, coupled with Hebrews chapter 11, and knowing that there are individuals who have faced some of the same things that we have faced, they have ran the race and they completed it. And they are left as examples for us to tell us, brethren, these individuals made it, or made it, so can you. To be godly is to be like God. And of course, again, that's living a godly life, not being God is being on the pope or being, you know, physically God. Brotherly kindness literally means to love the brethren. And Peter touched on this subject in his earlier epistle when he said to love the brotherhood, 1 Peter 2, verse 17. And this type of love, there are four types of love in the Greek language. This is the love that puts others before self. Uh, agape love. And so how can Christians uh, claim the love for God if there is no love for his brethren, 1 John 4, 20. And then charity, which is actually the word that I meant to use a moment ago, the agape love. And it is the strongest of all four of the Greek words for love. It is, again, love that puts others before self. This is the type of love uh, that was used when God sent Christ to this world. Of course, we all know John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this is the same type of love that uh, Peter, I mean, Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when he said that if a Christian does not have that love, when he, I guess you can say, uh, that love as a motivating force in his Christian life, that the things that he does is in vain. We've got to have that love as our motivating force. 
And so, brethren, these are things which we are to strengthen in our everyday lives. Now, we need to understand the fact that if we do not strengthen these graces, that if we do not work on doing our part in our lives, then there is an alternative to grow. And so I want us to look at verses 8 uh, through 11. For these things 